let me focus on about six very, very broad areas where I think uh, effort should be given and priorities, uh, uh, priority actions uh, focused on. Uh, Emil has already talked about all of this, so I'll be extremely brief. The first one is the issue of repurposing security, changing the way that we think about security. I highlight that as issue number one because I'm sure you've already talked about this. Most of us inherited our security sectors from colonial heritage. They came with a particular perspective in, 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 in mind. They were not democratic institutions. They were not there to protect the state. They were not created to protect people. Their purpose was in fact contrary. The entire operation was suppressive in nature. They were coercive, that's the way that they dealt with. That has unfortunately remained the dominant sub-theme in the way that we deal with security. It has remained dominant. And in the post-independence period, you recall we went through these one-party states, we had military governments and what have you. That has actually reinforced the image of the military and its identity, the notion of security. It's a preserve of a very few. Security as uh, a vehicle for controlling society, as opposed to defending society and defending the state. Now, one of the things that I think we need to do, and that point does not need to be belabored here, is to revisit what sort of security do we need? What is it for? What are our security challenges? What sort of structures and organization do we need in place to be able to deliver for us the kind of security that we need? And I think if each one of us goes back and reflects on our individual countries, you might find that actually there's quite a mismatch between what the security sector today is and what our key challenges are. Most of our problems are internal. Very, very few countries in Africa can point to a real threat from a neighbor or from outside. And if you will, most of our challenges are actually political. They're not even security. And yet we have a security infrastructure that is huge. It consumes some 25, 30% of the budget in some countries, perhaps as much as 40. The security budget is confidential. Nobody's supposed to know what it is. So we can't say, but it is huge. And yet that security is not aligned to our needs, to our interests, to our challenges. We need to address that. That is the beginning of addressing the issue of, uh, of, uh, of professionalism. It's a very political thing. It's very difficult to do. Very, very few countries have done that. We've seen it more in post-conflict countries, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia to some extent. South Sudan attempted it, but I don't think they went too far where there has been an attempt to try to step back and say, okay, what are our security challenges? What do we need security for? What sort of security infrastructure? How should it be organized? What should the values of that security institution be? How does it relate to people? And that debate cannot be done by the security sector. It has to be a countrywide thing. We have to develop a consensus about what security is about. We need to demystify it. Security is not about preserving. And, 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 and unless we get away from that, we will continue to have a security apparatus whose primary orientation is around the regime. It is indeed politicized. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave this point there, but just to suggest to you that the first step in strengthening professionalism in the military is to begin to look at the notion of security itself and the way that we think uh, about security, and that that is an exercise, an undertaking that has to be uh, done in a more holistic way involving the, 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 the whole uh, country. The second issue is one that Emil talked about, and that is the question of depoliticizing the military and security, and of course, demilitarizing politics. In very, very brief synoptic form, the whole issue here is that the security sector and the military have become the vehicle for political power. 
It is how we retain power, whether through a coup or one party state or sham elections that go on over and over again. It's the way in which the, the military is behind that. That is the, the key vehicle that allows us to gain power. It is how we retain power. It is how we mediate political differences. Any little problem, we bring out the military to come and solve it. Inevitably, of course, that brings the military into the realm of politics. We then make sure that we appoint the right people to head the military because otherwise they may not be able to do our bidding. Uh, and uh, once you begin to do that, you seriously undermine uh, professionalism because there is no way that a military that is oriented in that fashion and that is manipulated and used for political purposes can become professional because some of the basic tenets that Emil talked about, merit-based profession, uh, 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 promotions, the question of... Uh, uh, allegiance to the state. You can be a, you can owe your allegiance to the state when your primary orientation is on the political political forces. And then of course the politicians themselves then begin to make sure that they keep the leadership of the military happy. The leadership of the military has to be happy. We then overlook their excesses, whether it is abuse of human rights or resources, some of the helicopter issues that you talk about here. There's collusion. And so we make sure that they are kept in place. So that is a second issue that we need to deal with. How do we depoliticize military and security? What sorts of structures and organs then do we need to do to put in place in order to, uh, to deal with that issue? The third point that I want to talk about very briefly is related to the issue of the internal governance of the military, the security sector questions regarding around recruitment and promotion, education, soldier development, uh, and so on. We have a very serious trend continent-wide. I'm sorry again to paint a very broad brush. Maybe I should say the majority of the African countries where our militaries were ethnic-based or uh, religious in their orientation or come from particular regions. That was the practice during colonialism. That is a practice that we've continued with in the post-independence period. And that seems inevitable when you politicize the military, then you obviously want to have a military that will be sympathetic or that you can control. So you bring your uncles and cousins in, in some countries up to 40 some percent of the military come from a particular village or the senior military officers. We need to move away, away from that to a merit-based uh, system where recruitment, the composition of the military is national, it's a Republican military, it represents the country as a whole. We promote people on the basis of merit. That then ensures that the kinds of ethical values and principles that you want to talk about will be put uh, in place. And that leads me then to uh, a fourth point about institutionalizing ethics and values. Emil talked about that already. I will not belabor the point except to highlight here that the key values, norms, and standards need to be very clearly articulated. You need to reduce those into forms that are available to everybody. You want to make sure that they are assimilated across the entire uh, force, that there's a clear code of conduct. And in particular, that the leaders behave in accordance with those uh, ethic, ethical values and standards. And in this regard, uh, I'm sure you've talked about military education. It's extremely important in, 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 in that context that uh, we have Education not as a one-off. It's not just military training about how to shoot and how to do this and the other, but rather, what is your responsibility towards the citizens? What is your responsibility to the state? How do you carry on? How are you supposed to carry yourself as an individual? What do we mean when we talk about allegiance to the state? How do we deal with orders and rules that may not be legitimate? 
there has to be continuous education throughout, not just of the senior officers, but of the entire rank and file uh, in the military. And that has to be integrated as a, as a, as a, as a key component of any effort to, to strengthen uh, professionalism. Five is the issue of accountability. Uh, again, that has been brought up before. Uh, the only point that I would add here is that uh, that needs to be institutionalized, accountability mechanisms. Anytime and we see this in our day-to-day -day lives, when you let a, a, a violation or a misconduct pass, you're establishing a precedent. It is going to be replicated, it's going to be repeated, particularly when a leader commits a wrong and nothing is done about it, then of course that signals to other people that this behavior is uh, accepted and ought to be uh, allowed. So a, a, a accountability mechanism is extremely critical. Uh, it needs to be a transparent one. It needs to be objective. And of course, it has to be consistent with due process because then the individual who is responsible knows that this is what I did wrong. Here were my due process rights. This is the trial that has gone on. And others see as well because there's a deterrent effect that comes out of that uh, uh, accountability uh, mechanism and how we deal with issues of, uh, of misconduct. And it has to be consistent. You can't just do it as a one-off and make it a selective kind of prosecution process because that then even undermines professionalism uh, further. Let me go to the sixth point uh, here. And I'm coming to my second to last. Corruption. This is an ethical issue. Emil has talked about it, talked about the helicopter thing. I don't know if you heard a, a couple of weeks ago, the president of Uganda saying that uh, there was an Al-Shabaab attack against the Ugandan contingency in Somalia. According to the public reports, about 54 people, soldiers were killed. And the president made the uh, point publicly that uh, this was a result of corruption, weaknesses in the military. Because some of the key officers, among other things, there was the equipment issue and rations not being provided, but among other things, some of the key people who are in command, and they've arrested two majors now, apparently they are going to be under a court martial, uh, bought their way into Somalia. It's become a practice that I'm sure some of you are familiar with where deployment, particularly to peacekeeping, is very lucrative. So you have to go to senior officers and pay them a little bit. Uh, this illustrates the seriousness of the issue of corruption. I think Emil talked about that already and something that we cannot ignore. Unfortunately, uh, in most of our countries now, corruption has become so endemic. There's no single official authorization, document, permit you can get without greasing somebody's hands. And that destroys the essence of our society totally. In the security sector, as I think the case of Uganda and Somalia illustrates, is devastating. And when security breaks down, of course, we have instability, we have all kinds of issues that arise from that. So one needs to deal very seriously with the issue of corruption. It is manifested through ghost soldiers, the diversion of salaries of soldiers. Uh, we have uh, uh, issues uh, involving rations that are not provided. How can you have a morale and even be able to fight as a force when food is not even provided uh, provided for you? Deployment promotions, as I talked about earlier, uh, and of course, in the area of, uh, of procurement. Which brings me to my last area uh, point here about oversight of the security sector. A very, very uh, challenging area. Everybody agrees it needs to be done both internally and externally. And I think this is a, a basic point that uh, you can have all the principles and standards and codes in place, but you need checks and balances. There has to be some entity somewhere that ensures that you're actually doing what you committed to do. And in the case of security, this is both something to be done by parliament, uh, as well as civil society has a role to play in ensuring uh, oversight, as well as the media. But it's a very problematic area for us. Uh, 
our parliaments unfortunately have not lived up to the task even when they have tried because security is such a significant serious issue not fit for the public representatives to be able to discuss so we don't allow that sometimes they are intimidated out of oversight there are also capacity challenges so parliaments by and large with the exception of very few countries have not been able to play that role of oversight we bring in questions of confidentiality we can't talk about the military budget because it is confidential we cannot talk about issues of deployment and promotion because that goes into that it was a country recently where uh, the inspector general of government wanted every public official to declare assets the president immediately jumped in and said you can't allow soldiers assets to be declared because that is a security issue and I said wait a minute how does that affect security yeah. so we really do need to put a lot of emphasis on this issue of uh, of uh, of oversight strengthen the formal mechanisms within parliament uh, and a lot of that is about change of attitude by the way we go in about capacity building capacity is one thing the primary thing is if we start out where i started with our different thinking about security look at it just like any other sector like health like education then you find that it is legitimate for you as a member of parliament as a citizen to be able to ask questions how are you performing what are you doing with that money are you delivering service are we getting value for the money that we put in are we ensuring that the people are behaving according to professional standards and i think this is where we need to go so let me just conclude with uh, a few very general uh, words here professionalism is essential it's critical in the security sector as it is in other areas it is linked directly as i think uh, has been illustrated by uh, the previous speaker to the effectiveness of the military it is a significant factor in engendering public trust and confidence in the military sector it is a factor in stability if you look at the countries that emil referred to earlier where there's been a high level of instability there's also a corresponding decline weakness in in professionalism more generally and more importantly the professionalism of the military has a direct relationship to political development and the consolidation of democracy as well as economic development so when you have instability you are not going to have economic development you are not going to have uh, uh, political uh, consolidation of uh, of democracy so we do need to prioritize it we need to emphasize we need to give it a, a lot of attention it is not an end state it is not something you achieve today it is something that one needs to consistently put an effort on to ensure that it is institutionalized and it is in place and it involves all of us not just the military involves the elected officials involves the civil uh, the executive branch as well as the members of the public more generally thank you very much